give you the mic, yo. <laughs> Praise the Lord and welcome to Calvary Grace Brother Church. And um, we're glad to be here today. It's a beautiful day outside. It's not cold. It's not hot. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we're doing a little media work here. 11, 12. Okay, hold on. We get it back. You can turn it back up to 10 now. Thank you. Amen. And you'll notice that we have a uh, scene of the cross on our overhead behind me because we're talking about the cross. Last Sunday, we started preaching about back to the cross. This Sunday, we hope to conclude for now, the second part of the message, back to the cross. Amen. Uh, but before we go any further, we're going to have a word of prayer this morning. And then we'll have a reading of the scripture. And in your Bibles, you're going to want to turn to Luke chapter 23. We're going to start at 32. That's where we see the scene of Jesus being crucified on the cross and with two criminals, one on his left and one on his right. Luke chapter 23. So we'll get to that. So hold that in your Bible until after the prayer. Amen. So uh, let us pray this morning. Father in heaven, we come before you to hallow your name. We've been singing about your name. We know it's holy, holy, holy. And you are the Lord God Almighty. You sit high and look low above the circle of the earth, Lord. And you tell us that the, that the earth is in a circle. So I don't know why people think the earth is flat. But if they look at your word, you already let us know that it's round because you said a circle. But anyway, Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor because man is philosophies are and thoughts are not your thoughts and not your philosophy. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts much higher than our thoughts. As far as the skies and the space is above the earth, so are your thoughts and ways above ours. We know that you are sovereign. You look over everything, Lord. You see the beginning from the end, past, present, and future. We praise you today because you alone are God. You're God in three persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. But yet you're one God, one Lord. And so we thank you today, Lord, and we praise you. As we lift up your name in this service, Lord, we want to praise you today and lift up your name because this is your day. This is the Lord's day, according to your word. We understand that every day belongs to you. But, Lord, this day, the first day of the week, Sunday, you call it your day. And so we need to come together, Lord, uh, in person, on social media, and any other way we can to corporately together give you praise and glory. As we worship together today. So we thank you today, Lord. We admit that we need you, Lord, every day. We thank you, Jesus, for your intercessory prayer for us because we are struggling in this world, this simple, wicked, vile, evil world that we live in. It's hard for us sometimes, Lord. You tell us that it's going to be hard because the world is going against what you prescribe. And you tell us to go with what you prescribe. That is your word. And the principles and the ways of your word. And not only that, to have the attitude that about things the way that you would want us to have. So, Lord, we thank you for bringing us through another week and to the beginning of this new week. And Lord, we can't make it without you. Your word tells us that it's in you that we move and have our being. And, Lord, so we thank you today. We can't do it without you, Lord. We would be just like anybody else. Trying to make it through this life on our own. But Lord, we have you. We have your word. So we thank you. We have your spirit. We praise you for that. Lord, we think about all those who are watching today on social media and those who are here live with us in person. Lord, we pray that because they looked in on this service and attended the service of Calvary Grace Brother Church, that they will hear a message that will uplift them today, that will perhaps save their heart and their soul. And Lord, Put them on the right track so that you may get glory and honor out of our lives. It's about you. It's not about us. It's not about what we're going to get. You've given us promises, and your promises are good. 
But Lord, we often break our promise to you. And so it's about you, about us serving you and living for you. You're going to take care of us. But Lord, we got to take care of doing what you want us to do. We got to bring attention to your kingdom. We got to get somebody to come into your kingdom through salvation in Jesus Christ. We got to live before people. We got to help. We got to love. We got to reach out. We got to pray. You've given us a work to do, Lord. A mighty work to do to continue what Jesus started when he walked here in the flesh some 2,000 years ago. So we praise you this day. Lord, we know that our nation is suffering and many nations are suffering around the world. Israel, Lord, whom you're going to work with in the future and you're going to redeem a certain amount of the folks of Israel, the uh, people you've called through covenant through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Lord, they're having a rough time right now. The current modern nation of Israel is struggling, Lord. They're on the precipice of a major war. There's fighting and attacks going on right now as we speak. And so, Lord, we know that's happening in all kinds of places around the world. But, Lord, we have to keep a special attention on Israel because you have made promises that you've yet to fulfill concerning Israel. And so, Lord, we thank you and we pray for them. We pray for peace in that country. We pray for salvation in that country. And we pray for salvation in all of them, in Africa, in Ukraine, in Russia, Lord, in America. We need your salvation all around the world. So we thank you today, Lord. We pray for those among us who are sick and struggling in nursing homes, in their homes, and caretakers that are taking care of them all over the place. People recovering from surgeries, people whose health and strength has gone down and they're weak and they're helpless. We pray that you would touch them today, Lord. We, we can name names like the Carsons, like the uh, Grangers, and we can name other names, Lord. And Lord, we got some that are uh, traveling today due to uh, medical procedures and checkups. We think about Brother Richard today and his wife, Elena, they are in the Cleveland area, Lord, that you would protect them and give them journey mercies. We pray for a good report uh, that they got from their checkup. And Lord, we just thank you today, Lord. And that's just a few of many. And we can extend those prayers, Lord, to our family members. Lord, we know a family, but we have sisters, we have cousins. We have uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters and children who are struggling right now in their health. And we have some that are struggling in their finances, struggling in relationships. Some marriages are in trouble. And Lord, you have the answer for it all. And in this world that we live in, we just pray that we will look at it through your eyes and not the world's ways, Lord, because your ways are better. They're good. They're eternal. And so we do pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for correction, instruction in righteousness that we may be thoroughly furnished to have what we need so that we can continue to do your work. And we know that comes through all the scriptures. Because you said all scriptures were given by inspiration and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. And so, Lord, we pray that we may continue to preach your word even today. Thank you, Lord, and praise you. We pray for our ministries that we are part of and support, like the gospel mission, reaching out to the down and out and the most needy people in the city of Dayton, drug addicts, those who are hungry, homeless. We pray for them, strengthen them, continue their support, continue to help us to support them. Show us what we can do to go down and volunteer sometimes. And Lord, we pray for uh, those who are, we've been supporting so long that they've reached the retirement age, like Gloria Ward at Sedan Bible Mission in Tennessee, Lord, as she's retired now. We pray that you would strengthen her because she has health issues and dementia issues. She served well for over 40 to 50 years, full time, as a missionary. Bless the good Lord. We know that her promises will be fulfilled in heaven. You're going to reward her. Lord, we pray for Pat Daniels, who's been working diligently with Child Evangelism International in the Dayton area to reach kids, Lord, 
from primarily age five to 12 with programs and blitzes in the neighborhoods and um, teaching and follow-up discipleship and Lord, uh, spearheading that ministry in the inner city, our inner city of Dayton, where the need is most. I, well, Lord, I don't know anymore. The need is equally great in the suburbs now. They, they may have material things more than those in the inner city, but Lord, they don't have more Jesus than they have in the inner city. Everybody, all have sinned and come short of your glory, Lord. And we see the evidence of it. We pray for children, Lord, that you would strengthen them for young people because, Lord, they're facing a world of uncertainty, of wickedness and violence, and it's getting worse according to your word. It's, you said it was going to get worse, and it is getting worse, Lord. What do they have to look forward to? Lord, I fear for them. But if they have Jesus Christ, Lord, they can rest assured that you are in control of their future, and you are in control of the world as well. So I pray that they will trust you, Lord Jesus, and begin to seek what you want for their lives and go the direction that you want them to go. I pray for parents, Lord, that they will get saved and guide their children correctly. That they will walk before their children in faith and pass on their faith so that they won't depart from the faith when they get old. Lord, we pray that today. We thank you today, Lord. There's so many more things we could pray for. We pray for our country. Lord, we pray for our president, President Joe Biden and his cabinet and all those who are in authority and working in the government, even our state, even our city. Mayor Mims and Governor DeWine and all those who work under them. Lord, that you would guide them some kind of way. We know they're not all saved. But Lord, still you're in control. We pray that you would put boundaries on wrong policies and wrong legislation. That you would draw them into the right thing to do. All the way from the White House to our house. We pray this, Lord. That our leaders would come to you and look to you for guidance. And put aside the politics. We thank you today, Lord. We pray that your word will go out strong and that we'll receive it, Lord, and we'll grow because of it. And we know, Lord, if we grow, that means change has to happen because if no change means no growth. So help us today, Lord, to even grow today because of your word. Lord, when it's all over with, we pray that you will be satisfied with what we've done and that you will get the glory. Because it's about you and your kingdom. It's about your glory. It's not about us. We ask all these things through the name of Jesus Christ, our go-between of us and you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us Jesus, who brings Jesus from heaven to earth into our souls. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you, brother. Uh, Brother Steve is going to read for us today. Brother Richard is traveling. And uh, we ask that you would remind him of what the scripture is again. Luke 23, and starts in verse 32 to 43. Couple seconds to get there. Okay, it's Luke chapter 23, verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with him sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, 
this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanging, blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Thank you, Brother Steve, for reading the word for us today. Amen. Please hold that passage in your Bible. We'll be going back to there shortly for the message. I want to say again, welcome to everybody. Good to see those who are here today with us in person. God bless you. And uh, it's a great day to be together to worship. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, at this time, we just want to uh, say a few things uh, before we pray for our offering today. Um, we want to uh, make sure that you are aware that we do have a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're still doing it via Zoom. By uh, using our computers, our tablets, our phones. And we're studying about the promise of the Holy Spirit that we now have. The promise that Jesus gave to his apostles before he left earth. After he resurrected and he went back to heaven. He promised them that he would send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to live in our souls. That's how we get Jesus when we put our faith and trust in Christ. Because Jesus himself with the body is in heaven on the right hand of the Father. He don't come down in bodily form to every person that receives him. He comes down through the Holy Spirit to every person that receives him, and he lives in your soul. Amen? So you're not possessed with the body of Christ. I'm not possessed with the body of Christ. Jesus Christ has one body, and he has that with him in heaven. So if you're going to get Jesus, you got to get him through the Holy Ghost. The only way. But before that, you got to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. That's not a quick prayer. That's a life. That's a life that you give to Jesus. That's saying to Jesus, not only do I believe that you died on the cross. You rose on the third day. You did that in my place because I was guilty and born in sin. And I had no way to go to heaven because you said sin cannot exist in, the, in your presence, Lord. So how am I going to get there? Jesus has to get me there. He died in my place. You were supposed to be on one and you were supposed to be on this cross. The criminals were crucified on either side of him. That ain't the one you're supposed to be on. You're supposed to be on the one Jesus on. Jesus is on the one in the middle. Because we read what the Bible says, one was crucified on the left side of it and one was crucified on the right side of it. So the one in the middle is the one you were supposed to be on because of your sin and I was supposed to be there. I know I'm preaching a little bit right now, but I can't help myself. I'm a preacher. He did it for you. He took your place. You supposed to be nailed to the cross. I was supposed to be nailed to the cross. Amen. This, this is a quick little message. I had to give it to you. We supposed to be doing a little couple of announcements, right? Amen. Uh, we are studying about the Holy Spirit on Wednesday nights. We're looking at all the scriptures has to say about it. And uh, we're using a guide and a book uh, by Dr. Tony Evans called The Promise, Experiencing God's Greatest Gift, the Holy Spirit. And uh, we've gone through out of there are 18 chapters. We have completed chapter one, chapter two, and we start on chapter three. Chapter three is about experiencing the security of the spirit. Is your salvation secure? The Bible tells us if it is or if it isn't. But the spirit has a lot to do with whether your salvation remains, whether it is secure or not. You need to know what the word of God has to say. I want to invite you to join us at seven o'clock on Wednesday nights. If you want a link to the Zoom Bible study, 
just uh, send us a text, give us a phone call, send us an email uh, for the social media group. And that information is down below in the monitor. And so that is Wednesday night Bible study. And we do have some prayer as well. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, I don't think we have anything else to announce. Our blitz season for child evangelism is getting ready to gear up. Um, I think maybe this past week or either next week, they've already had some training for it. You may have missed it already. And uh, the Child Evangelism Blitz is the program that uh, where our missionary sister Pat Daniels leads a team of people from various churches. And we go around the city rounding up children to bring them to a central location such as Calvary Church on a Saturday from about 11 o'clock to about 3 o'clock. We round them up and then we have a program. We have food. We have teaching. We're singing. We have prizes. We have games. We do all that for ages 5 to 12. Now, if you're uh, older than that, you can come and help. Even young people, teenagers, if you want to help, you can be involved in that. Now, the first blitz starts in the month of May. Okay, and uh, I'll announce to you where it's going to be. We move it around from month to month. It's not going to be a cavern for a few months. So we'll keep that uh, before you in case you want to get on the child evangelism team this year and work for the Lord in that way to reach children. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have several members of our church on that team. We've been on that team for many, many years. Sheree and I have been on the team uh, in, a, in the capacity where we teach in the schools. Uh, we did that for about 10 years. Then after that, I continued being on the Blitz team, reaching out to children in the neighborhood for the monthly programs. And I've been doing that ever since. And so 25 years, maybe longer. We've had people from this church on that team. So that's a that's an extension of our ministry. We, we're part of that ministry. Child Evangelism Fellowship International. This organization reaches children all over the world. We have a chapter just a few doors up the street right here on Main Street, Dayton, Ohio. Called the Miami Valley chapter of child evangelism. And we've been a part of that ever since our church has been in existence since before 1980. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. I think at this time, we're going to have our prayer for our offering. Offering is two areas. It's a lot of areas. God says, first of all, he wants you to offer your life. He said, I'll be, I beg you. Paul, he told Paul to tell us. And Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. God wants us to give him ourselves first. Did you know God never gets hungry? He'll never need no money to go to Kroger's. And we put money in the plate, but God don't need it. God doesn't need anything. We need it. God's ministry down here on earth needs it. So God has set up a, a way for us to participate by giving the first part of our income. You say, but wait a minute, I got my check last week and I, I spent most of it. Well, the first part means you save the first part for God so that you can come on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and put it in the Lord's treasury, which is the church treasury. Okay? It goes from here and we put it in the bank and then we use it for the ministry. Okay? To do all the things we need to do for the Lord's work here. And then churches all over the world do this. Okay? And so God requires for us to give back to him a part of our income. Uh, it doesn't matter how old we are. If we get income, God expects us to take a part of it and save it and give it to him. And that shows that you're depending on him and not on money, not on your job, and not on everything else. Because one of these days, you might not have any money. And one of these days, you might not have a job. And then you're going to want God to take care of you. One of these days, the economy might drop out. One of these days, your money in the bank might not have any value. So you're supposed to put money in God's bank and God keeps credit in heaven for you. Even though we spend the money, God gives you the credit in heaven. 
so that one day when you need it, God's going to make sure you have it. God is the one who blesses us. And so that's what we that's why we give offerings, because the Bible tells us to. Uh, the standard that we use is the tithe, because that was the standard that God used in the Old Testament. Tithe means 10, 10 percent. That means you get a dollar, 10 percent of a dollar is a dime. You get two dollars, that's two dimes. You get a hundred dollars, that's a hundred dimes. That would be a hundred dimes is ten dollars. So ten dollars is ten percent of a hundred. And that's just a start, okay? That's just a tie. Then he says, give other offerings besides that. And God gave us examples all the way through the Bible of other offerings that you give when people have needs. You give offerings to the church for projects, for building, for maintenance, for uh, building bathrooms, for building parking lots, other things that the church needs, for pews, for carpet, for uh, whatever that we need. So other offerings sometimes are needed besides the tithe. Okay? And so the offerings are, you get to choose how much you want to give from the offerings. But the tithe belongs to God. The first part belongs to God. The offerings, you get to, you get to choose how much. You got $20 and uh, you want to give all of it. You can give all of it at $20 for offering. You want to give just a dollar of it, you can give, you got to choose. But however you give it, give it cheerfully, the Bible says. Don't give it grudgingly. Don't give it with a bad attitude. God says he loves a, what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. Now that applies to the offerings. The tithe is commanded by God. Okay? We know there's a lot of people out here that say it ain't commanded in the New Testament, but they didn't keep reading through Hebrews, especially chapter 7. Okay? You keep reading the whole Bible, you see that God respects us to give us the first fruit of our inquiry. First fruit is synonymous with tithes. Okay? The first fruit. And the reason they call it fruit is because back in the ancient Bible days, they weren't working with green cash and silver coins all the time. They was working with whatever they had. If they had farm animals, they gave part of that. They had flocks and they had, you know, stuff like that. They brought the first part of their flocks to the temple to give to the priest for the work of the Lord. If they had a field of corn, they took the first part of the corn and they brought the fruit of the corn to the priest, to the temple. So today we don't, we all of us are not, we're not farmers and we don't bring sheep and cows and chickens and, 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 and wheat and fruit and grapes. We bring money. We, 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 our bartering system is money, electronic or cash. Okay. So that's how we're to give to God the way we get it because we get it that way. And so that's how the way we give. Okay. So you don't have 10 sheep where you can give, bring us. Bring a sheep in here and give it, right? You got 10 cherry trees. Did you, did you pick 10 bushels of cherries? No. And you, so you don't have a bushel to bring to the, to the ministry. We do it with money. So that's what's meant by the giving. Okay? And I, I went through that because we got young people, and I don't know how much they know, but when I was young, I was taught to start tithing as soon as I got income. So somehow today we've quit teaching children how to start giving to the Lord. I taught my children from the time they were born and able to get anything from us, even an allowance, to give the first part to God. And they're still doing it today. And nobody's got to twist their hand. And they ain't got to say, oh, no, I'm saving this for my pizza or for my party or whatever. They still do it as adults. So we train our children. If they see us do it, and then we train them that they're supposed to follow the word of God, then it makes it easier for them when they get older to honor God with the first fruit of their increase financially. Amen. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray to bless the tithes and offerings today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we want you to hold it until the end of the service and then give it at the end if you would please. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One of these days, one of these days, somebody else gonna be doing announcements, so you don't get like three or four sermons before the before the main sermon, right? That's the danger of letting the preacher do everything, right? Y'all better get me away from up here.
<laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, praise God from whom all the blessings flow. If I had to give the tongues today, I'll speak in Swahili so you would understand. Those of you, you adults who don't understand English very well, my apologies. Uh, I had big dreams for our loved one, Rebecca. She was going to be my interpreter, man. She was going to be my interpreter. But the Lord needed her in heaven. He had a plan for her to be there. He wanted her there for some reason. Now, so when he wants you, it's better to be with him. It really is. Yeah. She's better off than we are. Way much better off than we are. She's in a perfect place with a perfect safe. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can't, we need to be saying we can't wait to get there too. Don't go out and kill yourself. God might God want to use you here. The purpose for your life is to be used for God while you're here until you go to heaven. Did you know that, Christian? Yeah, right. That's the purpose of your life. And did you know that because of the, uh, 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 you living for God, that the world ain't going to like it? When you got to live a certain way for God and the world don't like it and they put pressure on you, that's carrying your cross. And we're going to be talking about back to the cross for the second time today, for the second part. You got a cross to carry. To carry your cross means you identify with Jesus in what he had to do for the kingdom. I got to follow in Christ's footsteps to make sure that I honor God and bring expansion to his kingdom by my life before others and helping others to come to the kingdom. That's what carrying your cross is. I got to fight against this evil world. I got to go to work and fight with and work among people who don't believe in God, who don't treat you fair, work you wrong, don't give you promotions when you're supposed to get promotions, overlook you and have others go ahead of you when it should have been your turn. See, that's you, and you got to stay there and you got to work like you working for God. You can't work like you working for man because you're a Christian, so you got to do your job good because you're working your job as unto the Lord. And so because you watching people get ahead of you when it should be your turn, that's a cross that you bear because you're Christian. Every Christian is not going to suffer the same, but every Christian is going to suffer. Let me say that again. Every Christian is not going to suffer the same, but every Christian is going to suffer sometimes. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, if the world persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. Jesus said that. So you got to expect that he know what he's talking about. We're going to have to carry our cross in this world. <clears throat> that means we're not going to be able to do everything everybody else do. We, we, we're not going to be able to follow the, 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 the Beyonce's and uh, the Jay-Z's. Those are also my favorite examples. Uh, we're not going to be able to follow uh, some of the philosophies of the world. We're not going to be able to follow some of the ways uh, of the government. We got to obey the rules and laws of the man, but uh, some of them laws and some of the rules are against God. We're supposed to love everybody, but we ain't supposed to accept the ways of everybody. Even if the government says it's okay. But back to the cross. Are you in Luke chapter 23? I've already prayed and asked God's help for the message during the opening prayer. So right now, going into the message, back to the cross. Uh, in Luke 23, we, we, we see the scene of when Jesus first went to the cross <clears throat> and I put a picture up today just to kind of give us a visual. Uh, most times when you see the three crosses, there's always the one in the middle is the big one and the two on the side are small. That, that ain't true. The Roman government didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't care who he was. They put him on the same type of cross as everybody else. 
Jesus wasn't the only one put on the cross. This was the common way of, of, uh, of corporate execution, capital punishment for the Roman government. It may have been more than three crosses up on the hill that day. But we know that there, Jesus was there and it was a criminal on both sides of him that was crucified. It could have been more than them up uh, on the cross. On cross. Crosses was a common way of the Roman government back in ancient times of executing people. So Jesus and these two guys were the only one that was executed on the cross. Okay. And so one was crucified on the right hand and one was crucified on the left hand. And as we read the story, if you remember the story, one of them realized that he deserved to be there. Now, the other gospel writers outside of Luke said that both of them mocked Jesus. They made fun of Jesus. Hey, you supposed to be the same to get yourself down and get us down too. If you're the king of the Jews, uh, where's your army at? Why are you letting people nail you to a cross? They were saying stuff like that to him. And then one of them said, listen, man, listen, listen. He, he's innocent. We're supposed to be a period. He looked around Jesus over to the other guy and said, look, look, me and you, we're supposed to be up here. We real criminals. This guy ain't done nothing wrong. And when he went to those courts, they couldn't find nothing wrong. They couldn't even find two witnesses that agreed on what he did wrong. But they wanted to kill him anyway. And they did kill him. But see, what they didn't understand is that this was a plan by God before the foundation of the world. Before God ever made the earth, they made the stars and the moon and the sun and the planets and the trees and the fish of the sea. And then before he even made people, God already had looked down through the future and saw that we were going to need a savior, that Adam and Eve was going to sin and all of us was going to sin too. And before he made everything, he said, let me put the plan in place before I make the world. And before God even made the world, he had planned for Jesus already. Him and Jesus talked about it. And the Holy Spirit in eternity past. They talked about it. They planned for it. And this was planned for the foundation of the world. So the Roman soldiers, yeah, they're the ones that actually controlled the nails in his hand, but they didn't make the plan. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish people who should have knew what the law was, who should have known Jesus was coming, they're the ones that helped spirit to get him up there. They're the ones that really got him convicted more so than the Roman government. His own people, the Jews. His own people. They're the ones that demanded that he be crucified. Pilate, who was a Roman governor, wanted to let him go. He tried several times. I find no fault in him. As Pilate even hoped that they would let, when they, they had a custom, that they would let one criminal go, whoever the people wanted to let go. And Pilate was hoping and praying that they would say, let it be Jesus, let Jesus go. But you know, they chose the worst, one of the worst criminals they ever had, Barabbas. He was a murderer, an insurrectionist against the Roman government, and had done all kind of evil, thief and everything else. You name it, Barabbas was doing it. And Pilate was saying, I hope they let Jesus go. I hope they say Jesus and not Barabbas. And so Pilate said, okay, it's a custom that you let one man go, let a criminal go. Which criminal do you want me to let go this time? And they said, Barabbas, let him go. Well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him, they say. That's what crucifixion is, to be put to death and hung on a cross. And so that's what happened. But it was according to God's plan. If Jesus had to done that, me and you would still be on our way to hell. We'd have no way to get to heaven. No way. So we got to always remember that we got to carry a cross every day. Every day. Now let me read you another scripture where Jesus reminds us that we got to carry our cross every day. Now you're in Luke. Uh, 23, but if you go to Luke 9, same book, just go back to chapter 9, please. Go back to chapter 9 and look at verse 
23. And I'm going to read it for sake of time to keep going. Then he said to them all, this is Jesus talking. Luke is writing it down what Jesus said. Then he said to them all, verse 23, Luke 9, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross monthly, annually, daily, every day. Daily means every day. Every day. Uh, not just Sunday, but every day. Take up your cross and do what after you get it? Follow me. Okay, where was he going with his cross? Where did he go? Where did Jesus go when he had to carry his cross? He went up on God, got the hill, a place called the skull, and got crucified. And then he was buried. Then he rose on the third day. And then later on, he ascended back to heaven. Well, he said, follow me. So what we got to do? We got to carry our cross until we get crucified. And then when we raise up, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, until we go to heaven. So what's your cross? Your cross is to identify with Jesus and live a life for Jesus, even if it means you're going to suffer. Even if it means you can't get what the other kids get. You can't say what the other kids say. You can't do what the other people do. You can't buy the same house and cars that the other adults buy. Because you pay tithes and you don't have the money that they have. Oh, but they get that little glory right now. And they still in God's money by not giving tithes and offerings. But who's, who's going to have a better retirement plan? They might have a little bit better money on earth when they retire, but that's if they get to retire. But you want to have a better retirement in heaven forever. So which is going to be best in the long run, in the eternal run? The short time we be on earth or the forever time we're going to be with the Lord in heaven? Of course, the forever time that we're going to be with the Lord in heaven. That's where your retirement should be going. So how do you store for your retirement? By taking your cross every day and doing what God wants us to do and be continue on that road until God takes us to heaven. Identify with Christ. The cross means you identify with Christ. I'm doing what Christ did. I'm going to wear the cross. I'm going to stay near the cross. We sung a song earlier today called Near the Cross. Near the cross. Stay near the cross. Remember that you got a cross every day to carry. Some people don't cross. A, a cross means you're heading for a, to death to yourself and death to this world so you can be alive to Christ forevermore. That's what you're saying when you say take up the cross. Now, Jesus, we're still in 923. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. But what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the son of man, which is Jesus, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. If you're a Christian, if you're a real Christian, you are not to be ashamed of living for Jesus. If you're ashamed of Jesus before people, before your schoolmates, before your employer, your co-workers, before your neighbors, before those you go to, the, you see at the store, those of us who go to the gym, to the Y, we're ashamed. they talk about everything they want to talk about. They talk about some stuff that we are not to be engaging in and talking about. So we should take the conversation to a Jesus level and talk about God and his things. If you want to get rid of them, talk about God. They'll, they'll back off. They'll, be, they'll, get, they'll, they'll start moving away from you. If you want to go to the gym and if you want to get a workout in instead of get, talking out to every machine for a half hour to people, talk about the Lord. They'll leave you alone and you work out and get your workout over with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
if you're in a grocery store line and the line is long, start talking to the people in the grocery store line about the Lord. You might see that somebody might say, hey, you can come, you can go in front of me. <laughs> they want to get you on out of the store. They don't want to sit there and hear you talk about the Lord, okay? <laughs> uh, take up your cross daily, but don't be ashamed. If you're a Christian, be a Christian. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. If you be ashamed of the Lord, we just read, God says he'll be ashamed of you when he comes in his own glory. He's going to be ashamed of you. So don't be ashamed of the Lord. Now, don't be a fool. You can't go into work with your Bible and start throwing your Bible around and not doing your job. That will be stupid. You want to do the best job so that people will uh, respect what you do. And, and you might have an opportunity somewhere along the way to tell somebody on your job about Christ. I've been able to do that many times. I've been able to shut my office door and get on in my knees with students and pray with them to receive the Lord Jesus right in St. Clair. And I ain't been fired yet, but I hope I can still make it to December 1 because that's when I'm retired. And so over the 20 years I've been there, I, I, I've made it so far. Praise God. But I ain't stupid. I'm not walking into my boss's office, slamming the door and opening up my Bible. Talking about, you got to hear me now. He might listen to me for a few minutes, but next day I might get a phone call saying, you don't need to come in. And I've gotten phone calls like that, too. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> Amen. I lost several jobs in my lifetime. And I believe I lost them because I was standing for the Lord. But you know, every time I lost one, I had a man to call and fire me at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. I'm halfway asleep. Who is this? Uh, you don't have to bother to come in tomorrow. What are you talking about? You can collect your check. Your check will be there, you know, but I had that phone call on a Sunday night around 10 o'clock. And you know that's wrong. Somebody call you on Sunday night to fire you. You have sleep. TV watching you. And they're going to fire you. Oh, you know, I, I got somebody called Ted Curtis in me. That's my daddy. And Ted Curtis is a wise man. He don't take, if he don't take no for an answer, especially if it's wrong. I, I went to see him the next day. Now, that's another story I know, but I went to see him and talked to him, trying to find out why he, he couldn't give me a good reason. And I think it's, uh, he had changed his mind. He decided to hire somebody else instead of me. And that's all it was. Uh, it wasn't nothing thing I did was we were just getting started with the job. I'd only been there two weeks through the training. I didn't have time to mess up nothing. <laughs> and, but he, he fired me right at the beginning. <laughs> but you know what? It, I don't know if, if it was even a week. I got a better job. Every time I've been fired, the two, the three or four times I can think of, every time I've been fired, God, and I can tell you about them one by one, God give me a better job and he do it right away. And right away. And so I learned a lesson. Don't fear man because of your job. Stay, keep, and I, I was bearing a cross. You know, I was young. I ain't have nothing. That broke down car, beat up car. You know, so you know, I had a, some rough times. But the Lord got me through them. I trusted God through it. I got through it. You know, I got through it. And God will take care of you too. But it's back to the cross. Now, what I want to do today is I want to put a few passages up on the screen and I want to talk about it. We done read the story a couple of times now about what happened with Jesus and the two criminals. Um... <clears throat> We know that the soldiers mock Jesus, the criminals mock Jesus, the people standing around mock Jesus and said, if he be king, come on down off the cross. And uh, God made sure that what they put on that cross was true. And Brother Steve read it for us. And then back to Luke now, we're back to Luke 23, our main passage. And uh, they wrote above his Above his head on a on a placard, uh, they wrote it in three languages, in languages of all people around, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews, and God made sure that they put it up there because it was true. Now, why did they put it, put it up over his head? Why did they put it up there? 
because the Roman government, when they crucified somebody, they put the sentence above their head on the cross. Jesus was the only one who had something on top of his cross. The criminals had something on top of their cross, too. Probably thief, murder, insurrectionist was on one of them's cross. And probably something similar was on the other thief's cross, other criminal's cross. But the Roman government, they would put whatever you're guilty of, they put that on, whatever you're being crucified for, they put that over you, over top of you on the cross. Jesus was being crucified for claiming that he was king of the Jews and the Jews were threatened by that. And all the other things, they said he was raising a ruckus around, and he was stirring up trouble. They had all kinds of accusations. But the one they put over his head was the main one, which was the this is the king of the Jews. And it was true. He is, and he was, and he will always be the king of the Jews. But he's not just the Jews. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords for all of us. Amen. Did you know that? <clears throat> it don't make you a Jew. It make you saved. Okay. <clears throat> the Jews don't go to heaven because they're Jews. The Jews go to heaven because of the same way we go. They put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only way they go to heaven too. Ain't but one way to go. Now, you might say, well, what is the Christian life supposed to be? That criminal on the cross that said, Lord, remember me uh, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and looked at him and said, uh, you will be with me this day in paradise. In other words, you say you're going with me. You leave this, leave, when you die and your soul leave you, you're going with me. You're going to be with me in heaven for eternity. That's what he promised to the one criminal that admitted that he needed to, that he needed to be up there and that he said he believed in Jesus and Jesus I want you to, to take me with you in your kingdom. He was saying save me I want to be with you. I believe you. I believe you who you say you are. And that criminal got saved. Now what's a Christian supposed to do? Me and you get saved. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to die today we get saved and go to heaven? <clears throat> no that's up to the Lord. You're left here to do a job for God. What are you left here to do? You are left here to be a believer who obeys the word of God. You're supposed to get baptized in a local church and be a part of that church and participate with the members of that church in doing the work of the Lord, being discipled by the word of God and loving God and loving your neighbors like God. That's what we're supposed to be doing in a nutshell as Christians once we put our faith and trust in Christ. We're supposed to be living for God. Well, that soldier didn't get to do that. He died right there that day, same day Jesus died. So, so what does that mean? That means you can be as good as you want. You can do all the work you want. You can put as much money as you want on this plate. You can come to church every Sunday, and you can still go to hell because putting your faith and trust in what, this, what you do is not it. Put your faith and trust in Jesus is what gets you saved. That alone, alone, Without the other stuff, without the money, without the going to church, without the singing in the choir, without the preaching, without being a deacon, without doing the good deeds in the community, without doing the child evangelism, without doing the support the missionary, none of that saves you. That's just the work you do because you're saved. That's the work you do following your salvation. Yes, we're supposed to do that. But one of the proofs that that don't save you is that criminal. He didn't have a chance to be on the child evangelism team. He didn't have a chance to bring an offering to the offering plate. He didn't have a chance to come and be a preacher one day. He didn't have a chance to do nothing good in the neighborhood. He died that day on that cross after he got saved. That shows you that you can't put your faith and trust in all the stuff that you do. You got to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You got to want Jesus. If you want Jesus, you'll want what Jesus wants. You'll do what Jesus did. You'll go around and you'll raise the dead. You'll heal the sick. You'll feed the hungry. You'll look out for the poor. You say, preacher, what you talking about? How am I going to raise the dead? When you lead somebody to Jesus and they go from an 
on the way to hell to eternal death and to where they can have eternal life by following Jesus, you've raised the dead. That is the best raising of the dead you can ever do. If you had the ability right now to go up to the hot, go out to the to the cemetery and pick a grave and go to your, your mother, your brother, your sister's grave, and you had the ability to raise them up, and you raised them up from the grave, and they went home with you to be alive, guess what? They still got to die again. Jesus said you'll do greater things than these. He meant that you are going to help people raise up to eternal life to never die again, to live forever. That's real raising the dead right there. That's raising the dead. That's the raising dead that God wants you to do today. To bring somebody out of the darkness of the evil of the world into the marvelous light of Jesus. That's taking somebody from death to life. Amen. When's the last time you prayed for somebody for 20 days to get saved? When's the last time you gave your last dollar to somebody in hopes that they would listen to you and hear you about Jesus? When's the last time it quit being about you and it being about Jesus and somebody else coming to Jesus? <clears throat> you got a sister, brother, mother, uncle, aunt, grandmother, a uh, 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 cousin that needs to be saved? Write your name down somewhere, stick it in your Bible, and pray for them to get saved every day. God may answer that prayer. But isn't it a shame that we're not even praying for them to get saved? What are we doing? I know I can't get you to go out on the street corner and hand out tracts and give out bottles of water on a Saturday morning. Most of you won't do that. But can you pray for somebody? Can you pray for somebody in your family to need Jesus? What are we doing? I mean, when are we going to do that? That's if something you can do. You ain't even got to leave your house. But I don't think many of us do that even. On a regular basis. Are we praying for somebody to get saved? That we know needs salvation even in our own family? We don't got like the world. We just want to come to church on Sunday. And then after we leave, we want to do everything they do and forget about it. Forget about everything else. That ain't carrying the cross. That's following the world. We can't be like the thief on the <clears throat> cross that rejected Jesus Christ. That's the cross of rejection. We want to be like the thief on the other side who believed in Jesus. And that's the cross of redemption. He got redeemed that day. His soul got saved. That's redemption. Jesus did that. <clears throat> Listen to this true story about a man who, who, who didn't follow the crowd. But the people that did follow the crowd, they paid a heavy price. In the faithful winter morning of January 28th, true story, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger, remember the Space Shuttle Challenger, stood poised to be launched off. It was going to be launched to take seven people into space. Six astronauts and one teacher. Overnight, the temperature had plummeted into the 20s. At liftoff, it was 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the engineer that was employed by the manufacturer of the rocket boosters, his name was... <clears throat> Alan McDonald. This is a real true story about the, what happened. Alan McDonald <clears throat> tried to let him know that it's not a good idea to try to launch this rocket in 36 degree temperature. He said because at that temperature, the O-rings, O-rings are these little rubberized rings that help hold parts together in a in equipment okay and it helps hold it together tight and it allows it to have flexibility things that turn might have an o-ring in it to allow it to turn but not come apart i'm just trying to get the young people to see when an o-ring is with some of the old people too <clears throat> uh 
But an O-ring is a, is, is a ring that goes in equipment so that it is movable without coming apart, okay, until you take it apart intentionally. Well, McDonald told them that he don't believe it's safe to launch this rocket in 36 degree temperatures. He said because he don't believe the O-rings are designed to hold it up. And so <clears throat> he stood virtually alone as he steadfastly opposed the launch that icy morning, but he was overruled by the other engineers. The launch went ahead as scheduled, and 73 seconds later, after it was launched, six brave astronauts and one enthusiastic school teacher lost their lives when it blew up in the sky. Never reached space. Never reached out of our atmosphere before it blew up. I remember watching it on TV, and then shot when it happened. You remember that? You remember it? <clears throat> it was in 1986. Was Alan McDonald arrogant when he challenged the decision to launch? Was he intolerant? Any thinking person would say no. He was just unwilling to see innocent people die because others had ignored and distorted the facts. We would say Alan McDonald knew the truth and he stood up for it. It's always tempting to go with the flow and compromise with the crap. Well, I know everybody else going to the concert. So why can't I go? And you know it's wrong for you to go to a particular concert. <clears throat> but we should be warned by the cross of rejection, the criminal that rejected Jesus Christ. He mocked him to the end. When you die, when he died, he lifted his eyes up in hell, just like the man, the rich man in Luke chapter 16. And when the, the thief that repented died, he lifted up his eyes in paradise with Jesus. So one was on the cross of redemption, one who trusted Jesus, and the other one was on the cross of rejection. And actually, Jesus was the redeemer. So his was the cross of redemption. The thief that believed was on the cross of repentance. The thief that didn't believe was on the cross of rejection. Which cross would you be on today? If you're on the cross of repentance, you will hold on to your cross and follow Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I said I was going to put up a couple of scriptures here. I want to do that. Get this. This is where I want to be here. First one I want to, I want you to see, and I'll make it big as I can. If you quick with your Bible, you can find it. <coughs> Philippians two eight. Right here in the highlight, it says that being found in appearance, being found in appearance as a man, he talking about Jesus, he humbled himself He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He did that for you, and he did that for me. Even the death of the cross. <clears throat> First Corinthians 118 says, for the message of the cross, in other words, preaching about the cross like I'm doing today, is foolishness to those who are perishing. People that are going to reject Jesus are perishing. Perishing means they're going to die and go to hell. They are perishing. Okay? So when you preach about the cross to somebody perishing that don't want to hear it, it sounds like foolishness to them. But how should it sound to us Christians? 
To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The world think they're wise. By the world's wisdom, they think they're wise. But the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. Because God is wiser than the world. He's smarter than the world. God made the world. So here's the question I want to ask you. If the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but the message of the cross uh, to those of us who are being saved is the power of God, what do we mean being saved? Are you saved or are you not saved? What do we mean by being saved? Well, you receive Jesus Christ the moment you receive him, the moment you put your faith and trust in him and give your life to him. That happens in an instant. So I'm already saved. What do you mean, preacher, by being saved? This passage in Corinthians, he's already talking to Christians that are already saved. So what does he mean by being saved? I'm glad you asked. So you are saved. I'm going to tell you that you are saved, but you are being saved at the same time. Oh, preacher, you don't confuse me now. Listen, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord to save you back in whatever you did, it, you got saved that day forever and you have eternal life. Period. But you're being saved every day from the forces and the evil ways of Satan. You're being saved. See what page that is on in my notes. Page two. Page two. This why I wish I had my touch screen back when I had to fool with his mouth. We are being saved every day from the power and effects of sin throughout our history, throughout our life. You are fighting against the forces of Satan every day. The Bible told us in Ephesians 6 that we're wrestling against unseen forces. We're wrestling against the forces of death. And that's why we got to put on our godly armor, our helmet of salvation, our breastplate of righteousness, our shield of faith, our belt of truth, our shoes with the gospel. On uh, uh, sword, which is the, the word of God, which is the sword. We got to wear our armor because we're fighting a battle every day. We got to take up our cross and we got to fight every day. We're fighting against the evil ways of the world. So we are being saved from the physicalness of fighting the Christian life on a daily basis. One day we're going to be saved totally from that stuff when we get to heaven. We'll be taken out of the presence of the devil. We'll be taken out of the presence of evil. And we'll be in heaven in a perfect place where there's no devil, no evil to fight, and no right, no wrong. All right. But we're living in a world now where that ain't the case until we get to heaven. So we're being saved as we go along from that stuff. But that's not referring to our eternal security. We are eternally saved at the moment we receive Christ as our Lord. But we're being saved from the presence of sin as we fight through it every day. So that's how you save while being saved. It's clear as mud, right? All right. But that's what the message of the cross would do. The message of the cross is the power of God. God said there's power in that message. Power to save you and have eternal life. Now, we talked about we talked about them putting the sentence over your head. Okay? They put the sentence of Jesus that this is the king of the Jews over his head, and they was crucifying him for that. Now, Colossians 2.14 says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, the handwriting of requirement that was against Jesus was, this is the king of the Jews. They put that over top of his cross, over his head. That was the handwriting of requirement that the Romans put over top of Jesus. Having wiped out the handwriting requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. If we were put on the cross, you know what they put over our head? Sin. He's guilty of sin. Jesus was guilty of saying, this is king of the Jews. 
we will be guilty of sin will be above our head. And that handwriting will be written up above our head. Jesus has wiped out the handwriting requirement that's against us, which was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way because he nailed sin to the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So he disarmed. He disarmed the principalities, the powers of Satan, all the evil stuff. He took the, he took the power away from it. He disarmed it. And he took the powers away. He made a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over that. So if Jesus triumphed over it, and you got Jesus, guess what? You can triumph over it. You got Jesus. You can triumph over it. Praise God. Praise him. Jesus said in Luke 14, 24, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, Cannot be my disciple. You can't be a follower of Jesus if you don't take the cross. This message is called back to the cross. And we, if back to the cross means you, you knew about the cross in the first place when you became a Christian. So the message first is to Christians. We need to forget about what the world is telling us and get back to the cross. Back to carrying our cross for the Lord. Back to living for him. Going against what the world is talking about. Back to identify with Christ by carrying our cross like he carried a cross. Amen. If you don't do that, you can't be Jesus' disciple. You can't be a follower of Christ. You can't be a Christian if you don't take up your cross and follow Jesus. You got to remember, the saying of prayers is not magic words to get you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I trust in you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you were crucified buried and rose on the third day and uh, Lord I believe in you I, I, and I ask you to come to my heart and be my Savior. Yeah you need to say that but don't words by themselves don't say it. It's got to be a heart change. It's got to be a commitment to the Lord for your life, for the rest of your life. It's, it's too many times I've seen people come and say that prayer and we take them in this baptismal tank back here and they get baptized and then they come up and then they disappear into the, the world and you never hear from them and you never see them anymore and they ain't in nobody's church. Why? Because the magic words didn't take place in the heart. It was just words. Real salvation requires that you give your life to Jesus. Meaning you're going to take up your cross and you're going to follow him and you're going to do what he says to do. Amen. You're going to forget about your ways. You might have customs that you're used to from where you're from or where you grew up. But when you come to Jesus and you learn the word and you find out that some things are wrong about how you grew up and about some of your customs, then you change according to what God says. And when you change, that's showing that you grow. Growth is change. Change is growth. But if you say, no, nah, that's not my custom. This is the way we do it where I'm from. And you keep on doing wrong. Be careful. You might not be saved. You might not be saved. But I, I just want to go over some of these verses of, about the cross. Think of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. He had joy knowing what was going to happen on the other side of that crucifixion. And when he rose up and when he went to be back with the Father and what he's going to do for me and you, that gave joy to Jesus. He endured the cross because he saw the joy on the other end. You and I need to see the joy on the other end. Do you know how good it's going to be for us? Do you know how God, when he starts Fulfilling the promises that he made to us. It's going to be greater than anything you ever experienced on earth. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You got to endure your cross because of the joy that God has promised that you're going to have. Amen? I know this might not be a shocking message, but you got to go back to the cross, y'all. We forgot about the cross. We're busy doing everything else, but we forgot about carrying that cross. One day we're going to be around the throne of God too. We studied Revelation, the whole book in Wednesday night Bible study. We know what's going to happen because we studied the book that tells us what's going to happen at the end. 
We all going to be with Jesus at the end. Those who trust him and live for him. Amen. Yeah. He has promised we're going to be with him. And we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to be perfect. We're going to have everything we need. It's going to be great. So we got to endure our cross. Even if it, even, even if sometimes we got to be shamed by the public. Shamed by our fears. Even they ridicule us. They talk about us. They shame us because we ain't like them. Take it. That's your cross. Say, I'm going to take it for Jesus. Love him anyway. Tell him anyway. Reach out to him anyway. And I guarantee you that sometimes some of them are going to sneak back to you by themselves without the crowd and ask you how they can be like you. I know because that happened to me on more than one occasion where my friends who rejected me in front of everybody came back to me uh, by themselves to want to be like me when I was in high school. And I learned how not to be ashamed. I was more, sometimes I was more bolder back then than I am now. I don't know how that is. I need to get back to being bold. I can. I got. I got to get back to the cross. Back to the cross. About to finish up now. Let's see. You got to be willing to publicly identify with Jesus. When you take the cross, of that saying, I publicly identify with Jesus. When you deny the cross, you deny Jesus. You said, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me close now. I want to say the three crosses. One cross was holding a man that was Dying for his sin. He was dying for sin of everybody. That was a cross of redemption. On one cross, there was a man dying in sin. This was the man who rejected Jesus. And then on the other cross, there was a man dying to sin. He was dying as repentance. So we need to go back to the cross. Which cross are you going to take up? The cross of rejection? On the cross of repentance. You can't take the middle cross. Jesus got that. But you got to take one of the others. Are you going to reject them? Or are you going to repent? Repent means a change. Change your mind. If you were going wrong, start going right. If you were talking wrong, start talking right. If you were doing wrong, start doing right. Repent means change. That's what repent means. You've heard the scripture that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And his son Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Whoever in this world, whoever believes in him, will not perish. You won't go to hell. You won't go to the lake of fire. But you will have eternal life. In heaven with Jesus and on a perfect new earth with Jesus. And Romans told us if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. To confess with your mouth is to identify with Jesus with your life. That means you're going to confess Jesus all of your life by the way you live and by the way you talk. It's not just a quick prayer. It's a lifetime. Confession of the Lord Jesus Christ is with your all of your life. You're going to publicly confess something is to say it out public. You're going to confess Christ the rest of your life. That's what that means. It don't mean to say a quick prayer. Lord, I believe in you. And believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you should be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made every on a regular basis, every day. Confession. I'm Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ. For the rest of your life. At work. At the gym. At the grocery store. In my neighborhood. I'm confessing by the way I live. By what I talk about. That I 
following and identifying with Jesus. Amen. That's what confession means. It's not a quick prayer. Okay. Scripture says, whoever believes on him will not, will not be put to shame. At the end, the world's going to be the one that's shamed. And you're the one going to end up not being that shame. But there is no distinction. There is no difference between Jew or Greek. There is no difference between any race of people that God made. For the same Lord over all is rich to all. No matter what race you are. No matter what color you are. The same Lord is Lord over all. Is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Romans 10, 9 to 13. So, if you say, believe you with this, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily. Deny the ways of the world. Seek God's will for your life. Pray, read, hear the word, obey the word. That's if you're, if you're saved. If you're not saved, Hear John 3, 16, and hear Romans 10, 19. God bless you. Let's pray. Let me ask you to stand, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the cross. Lord, if we didn't have the cross, we'd have no, re no redemption, which means we wouldn't have anything. We would no, have no way to repent. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you redeemed us on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you became sin for us. You said in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 21, that, <clears throat> that the Father made you to become sin for us. You became sin. You didn't represent sin. You became sin for us. That's what the word says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We thank you, Lord. And you said that you became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that today. And we pray for the ones that are not saved, that they would truly give their life to you today. And we give you praise and glory. So that, Lord, we can know at the end we'll be able to say, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That concludes our message. That concludes the service today. Don't forget to leave your offering, please, in the offering plate up front. God bless you. Amen.